and in the series. We'll go a couple months on this at least as it covers a, a wide swath of issues, including how one is saved, the need for faith, God's grace, um, the, the duration of hell will be towards the end of the series to talk about that issue, really what people struggle with, which is the eternal nature of it or not. We'll do with that. Uh, we talked in our first lesson just introducing the concept and the problem that universalism brings to the table, which is, uh, you know, is everyone suffering in hell for eternity? Are all your friends and neighbors going to be burning in hell forever? And uh, that seems to be something very hurtful and burdensome to any one of you with a heart. You know, it's like really if you have compassion to people that you love. And so they solve that problem by simply saying to varying degrees, hell doesn't exist or it doesn't last forever or it's not so bad. And everyone will be saved in the end. Universalism is the belief that all men will be saved or made happy in the end. And that idea is held by large groups of people, a lot of them not Christian. It's, there are just naturally people don't like to think about needing to justify themselves before a God or something. So they assume the default comfortable position that I'm, it's going to be good. God's going to make me happy forever, even though I've not done anything to know about him or trust him or deal with my sins or anything like that. And so there are three kinds of universalism, generally speaking. One is the biblically ignorant kind, which doesn't know anything about the Bible, and yet they claim everyone's going to be saved because God's good. You know, I think he's good, and someone's going to be saved. This is typically the non-religious people or those who claim to be Christian and simply don't know why. Uh, that's one category of universalism. Another category is the Bible deniers. So you have the biblically ignorant, then you get the Bible deniers who, though they have a Bible and will claim to be Christian, they read it and are disgusted at parts of it and simply say, that is not true. So they're just simply denying those parts of the Bible they don't like. And the parts they do like, they'll take, you know, uh, maybe. And so the Bible denying universalists, often these go hand in hand with other heresies like Unitarianism and things like that. And then there's the third category, which I, I might title Bible correctors, which are people who want to believe the Bible as the Word of God. And they, they say they believe this. They want to be Christian. They try to justify that they're Christian. And yet they want to also believe in universalism. And so they're trying to apologize for the passages in the Bible that don't seem to teach that. And um, so they're constantly correcting the Scripture, uh, as is somewhat acceptable in different wings of Christianity now. And so I call these people the biblically hopeful people. They're, they're, they're hopeful and optimistic that universalism is true. But if they really had to hold their feet to the fires of Scripture, pun intended, then they'd have to admit that the Bible doesn't teach it as presented. So these are the three kinds of universalism. And uh, so you see there's many problems uh, with justifying universalism when it requires you to discard the Scripture. Yeah. Um, this is an issue. And this has always historically been the issue with universalism. It's more recently, maybe some of the universalists you've talked to or have known or yourself have tried to use the Bible to teach it, okay? And so last week we, we dealt with the, the issue of our deserving hell and our sin, uh, which is really the root cause and problem here. When you feel an offense at God's judgment against you, usually this is rooted in the fact that you don't appreciate your own sin or God's holiness. You don't recognize that to the extent that the Bible says you should. And so we dealt with that. Uh, the root of the hell problem, why people would go there, why God would have this as a thing, uh, is the problem of sin, right? No one deserves to go to hell if we're all innocent. <laughs> you see, that's not a thing. Uh, God is not a cruel monster. He is a righteous judge, which means when there's sin, there's a consequence, and hell is going to be that consequence of sin in the Scripture. So this week, I want to talk about Hell. What, what about hell? What does the Bible say about that? Um, universalists often, when we talk about the subject, and no doubt universalists, if, if you have the tendencies or if you've talked to people about the series here, they're frustrated because I'm not yet dealing with their issue because they immediately want to talk to you about God's grace and love, which why wouldn't you? I mean, we preach the gospel of the grace of God. We preach Romans 5, 8, God commended his love toward us, but it's toward us while we were yet sinners. And so there's something that we learn in the scripture before the gospel of the grace of God in order to know and believe and trust the gospel grace of God. And that comes prior to that. And, and so when we talk about the issue of hell, we talk about salvation from it, we talk about how long it is or who's in it, we have to go back to the beginning of the root cause of the issue, which is sin. Yeah. Right? So before we talk about love and grace and that sort of business through Jesus Christ, which is abundant, you have to know sin, you have to know God's judgment, you have to know about hell. Okay, so we will talk about those things, just not, not, this, not this week in detail. Universalism as a whole is, is all about escaping hell, right? And they, they begin doing that by ridiculing the doctrine of it or denying it outright. Okay, so today is what about hell? The biblical description. 
So when you, when you read universalist literature or, or those that would deny hell, often they start with caricatures or exaggerations of the doctrine of hell. And they do that just like cartoonists would do, exaggerating your features. They do that to ridicule it, to hold it in derision. Like it's not real. It's very cartoony. And so you'll find that's the case. They, they, they want to mock it and ridicule it because that's going to be their first step for you denying it and seeing that it's ridiculous that a loving God would ever have hell as a concept or send people there, especially forever. Okay. And so they're going to exaggerate the descriptions. Uh, when you just look at the idea of hell across the world, though that's not our authority, that doesn't prove anything, you actually find a lot of religions teach hell. Now, a lot of people may not believe in it because it's very uncomfortable for people to think about, but most religions, a lot of religions actually teach something of hell. Even religions you might think don't, that are, you think are more nicer religions or something. The Muslims, for example, Islam teaches there's seven layers of hell. In the same way, they also teach there's seven layers of heaven. You heard the TV show years ago, decades ago, Seventh Heaven. That's an Islamic concept, not a Christian concept, but there's also seven layers to hell. And uh, there's lots of descriptive ad, uh, 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 explanations of, of their hell. One of them is that you're showered with hot water like molten brass till it scalds your face. You're like, wow, that, that's gruesome. That's terrible. And by the way, you don't find that in the scripture anywhere, but this is something Islam. I bring that up because there's a lot of talk about hell that's not from the Bible. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about here. Um, the Greeks, they have their Hades, right? The underworld, Hades. And uh, in Hades, there's ferocious monsters that rip people apart down in Hades. And it's like, well, okay, um, that's not the Bible, right? <laughs> Even though some of the newer Bibles want to put the Greek Hades in their text. Uh, the Buddhists believe in hell. They say, oh, no, not the Buddhists. They're harmless. Oh, well, actually, uh, they do have a concept of hell called bardo. There's 33 hells, actually, in Buddhism. Uh, and by the way, I am not saying when these religions teach hell that they teach an eternal conscious torment or anything like this. No, it's just oftentimes temporary, but there are places of suffering and punishment and whatnot. So the Buddhists believe in 33 kinds of hell. The Hindus even have a concept of hell. They call it Naraka. You look that up in, on Google and you'll find the Hindu teaching on hell, which is suffering, even though Hindus believe in lots of different gods and lots of different beliefs, and there's also suffering. And uh, that's just part, part of the deal. And so there's hell as well. There are people in the world that do not believe in hell adamantly. And these typically come from aberrations of Christianity, yeah. ironically. Because it's in Christianity where you find the doctrine, specifically through Paul, where you're delivered from, salvation, uh, uh, from hell through salvation. And that God's grace abounds. And his love is commended through the death of Christ, right? And so because that's in the scripture, you find aberrations or, or distortions or corruptions of Christianity teaching that hell doesn't exist at all. This is not Christianity. This is not Christ-like. This is not good. And that would include the Jehovah Witnesses, the, the Mormon Seventh-day Adventists, which I know they would teach annihilationism, but the idea of, of denying an eternal conscious torment or denying uh, the traditional uh, idea of what, what hell is, that includes them. So, and you notice I put Christian cultists next to those groups uh, because they teach other extreme heresies. Um, Two of those groups, the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, do not believe the same God as you do. They say they would, but they don't think Jesus is God in the same way that you should from the scripture. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists think your salvation comes from keeping the Sabbath day and the law. And it's like, this is a problem. It's a big problem. So they, they have other issues. Uh, they think Jesus came back in 1914. It's like, no, that didn't happen. You know, so there's some problems with, with, with these groups. But they also, with them, uh, with those other issues, deny hell. By the way, I'm not just saying that just because they teach it, or just because the Buddhists teach it, that means we should reject what they're saying. I showed you other religions that teach hell also. So we need to really find out what the Bible says about it. And that's the issue of the lesson today. So hell as a concept is held in ridicule by especially modern, intelligent, sophisticated, advanced people. All right. I'm thinking of, as I was growing up, Gary Larson was popular. Some of you know Gary Larson from Far Side. And uh, the depictions of hell that he had, uh, one of them had a guy pushing a wheelbarrow and whistling a tune, and the devil's in the corner saying, we're just not reaching that guy, you know, because he was happily in hell, you know, things like that. So it's just a comic strip about hell. But we laugh at hell in our modern society because we're so comfortable and we're kind to our neighbors. Why wouldn't God? So go around talking to your friendly, nice neighbors about their hellish suffering? Like, that's not even polite, you know? So... Uh, it's, not, it's held in ridicule by modern society. So if you, if you talk about hell, and here I am talking and being recorded talking about hell, I'm seen as a bigot, 
a monster, cruel, unloving, unkind? It's like, you don't do that. It's impolite at the very least. You know, like, just leave that alone. Well, we're talking about the Bible, and that's why I'm bringing it up. We're talking about issues and corruptions in doctrine that, have effect, that, that, that are derived from a rejection of hell. So we have to go back and deal with some of these, these things. The culture, by the way, even though they don't like to talk about it seriously in polite company, do use the word hell quite a bit. Uh, in fact, if you, if you do the Google trend search on the word hell, it seems to be increasing quite a lot the last 15 or 20 years in the usage of the word hell. Uh, hell in a handbasket, for example, has been around for quite a while, about 150 years. Or hell or high water. You've heard that phrase, right? Come hell or high water. Or when hell freezes over. But yeah, all these sayings have a root in the understanding of hell. Do you understand? Yeah. Like, why is when hell freezes over mean it's never going to happen? Because there's not ice in hell. Unless you're a Zoroastrian, I guess. And they also teach that there's an icy hell as well. But, so it kind of matters. This is like a Christian concept of hell, you know. Or what about, uh, you know, just go to hell, which is something I don't practice saying to people because I don't want them to go there, but it's said quite often from people. Well, you get it, people get angry, they say, go to hell. What are they saying? Well, that's, 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 that's rude and, and, and offensive, and they're trying to be that because hell's an offensive place, right? That's why they say go to hell, because they don't want you to go to the happy place. They're not saying go to heaven. They're saying die and go to hell. In fact, I don't know anyone, save one, who says, die and go to heaven. And she says all the time, she says, drop dead. She, she says to me. And she means go to heaven. It's like, well, okay. But go to hell is what people say. They, they won't believe in heaven, but they'll say go to hell. Or when all hell breaks loose. What does that mean? It's like, man, it's chaotic. It's judgment. It's, it's terrible. The, the storm's really getting bad. Really bad. So hell's a bad place. Right? Well, th this is just ingrained in our culture. Why? There's a traditional cultural idea of what hell is. Is there any biblical truth to these ideas? That's what we're studying here this morning. Because what universalists would have you say is that there is no biblical truth to the cultural concepts of hell. They, they, the, the cultural, traditional concept of hell came from false religions and paganism, and Christians brought them into Christianity, and they have no basis in the Scripture whatsoever. Well, is it true? Let's figure that out. Is Satan the CEO of hell? Is he running things down there? Is he the, the king of hell? Is that his domain? What does the Bible say? What about Dante's Inferno? He's got nine circles of hell. You know, is that how it works? Where it's like the worst sins you do, you're lower down in hell. You know, and, and, and he, he, at the very bottom of hell, he had, he had Satan actually frozen, which was interesting, down at the, the ninth circle of hell. He was stuck, and he had a couple of the kings he didn't like down there. So you had your political adversaries down in the ninth circle of hell. But is that how hell works? Or what about Sam Smith and the Grammy performance, which I'm sure every one of you watched with just intention and, and desire. I uh, dressed up like the devil, dancing around like it was hell, like it's a party or something. Like, what, what is that? But, you know, he's the devil, and it's, everything's red, and he got horns off his head and things like that. That was in the culture. Is it medieval torture? People think of hell like that, and describe it in terms of, like, a torture chamber in medieval times. You know, there's God down there putting people on the rack and just, uh, he's enjoying the torture that comes from these people. Is that what it is? Or is it just some fiery furnace, like God likes barbecuing people for eternity? Is that the God we serve, really? Um, well... Those seem to be exaggerations in some cases. Other cases, they seem like cultural inventions. But the real question is, again, what does the Bible say? Hell, when you use the word, has a cultural connotation. It has a meaning. Okay. Uh, religious depictions that, it, it has a connotation in religious depiction that no hellers, those who don't agree with hell, use to deny the scripture. Okay. What does the Bible say about hell? How is it described in scripture? And so we open up the Bible. We try to define the word hell. Now, I'll give you a definition here, and then we'll try to show that definition from the Scripture, uh, just so you can look for it there. But hell can be defined, biblically, I, I think we'll prove here, that it's a place for souls of the dead and damned reserved for judgment. That's what hell is. All right? And people say, well, show me hell in the Bible. And you open up the Bible, and you say, well, there it is. There's 54 instances of the word hell in my King James Bible. And they say, well... Already we have a question. We have a problem here. And every time this subject comes up and you're trying to study the biblical definition of hell, it always begins with this conversation about the Hebrew and Greek words of hell. And here's what you need to know. As we said in other lessons, as we taught here before, when teachers revert to Hebrew and Greek is because they want to change the clear truth that's in the English. Amen. Else they'd use the English. Like, we don't in our churches teach in Greek all the time, or Hebrew, right? 
we bring up Hebrew, people bring up Hebrew and Greek because the English they say is insufficient or in some cases wrong. So know that. When you hear a preacher or teacher say, the Greek says and the Hebrew says here, your red flag should grow up. It's like, why are they doing that? Are they about to change what the Bible says in English? Are they just trying to explain further? And if so, why can't they just explain further in my own language? Right? Why are they speaking to me, who am not an expert in Greek and Hebrew? How am I supposed to verify what they said was true? You see, there's a whole problem with this when you do it pastorally. You're talking about throwing Greek and Hebrew languages in the trash can of history, in the hell of history, but um, it's, you don't understand what's going on. So maybe some of you have heard the word Sheol, along with other Hebrew words that you're familiar with just from the culture, like hallelujah or something like that. Sheol is just something that has floated around. It's a Hebrew word. Because in the Old Testament of the Bible, it's the Hebrew word Sheol, not hell, we're told. Well, actually, hell's a translation of the word Sheol into English. Sheol's Hebrew, hell's English. That's how that works. But it's the Hebrew, Strong's number 87585. So we're going to study the, the Hebrew word Sheol throughout. We'll find that actually, a lot of times, that word Sheol is translated grave in your Bible. And therefore, every instance of Sheol must be grave. Question. Why? Why doesn't every instance of the word Sheol need to be hell instead of grave? Like, who just determined it has to be grave? There's an agenda, you understand? There's a motivation for why they want it to be grave and not hell. They don't want you to have the cultural depiction and definition of it. They don't want to have a biblical definition of it. They want it to be something else. So be careful with that. By the way, we've mentioned this before about translation. It's not true that the same foreign word has to always be translated with the same English word. If any of you speak other languages, you know that to be true. Okay. So this is a nonsensical thing when it comes to Bible translation, that every time you see a word, it has to be the same word in your language. Context does determine meaning. And words have different meanings. And so that, that's a thing in language. Meanwhile, you see the word sheol, which is the Hebrew word in the Old Testament that's translated hell in your King James Bible, or the word Gehenna. Again, this is a, a word referring to the, the burn pile, the garbage heap outside of Jerusalem, the Valley of Hinnom. Right? And they'll say, well, this is what it is. It's not hell. It's the garbage dump outside in Jerusalem. It's not some eternal fiery pit where God barbecues humanity for eternity. And then there's the third word used to translate hell. There's actually four, but the third one used in majority is Hades, which is the Greek word in the New Testament used primarily, apart from Gehenna. That uh, Hades, as I mentioned before, is actually the term that the Greeks used for their hell. Right. And so by... Some Bibles take the word hell out and put Hades in there in your English Bible, making it untranslated and somewhat open to the concept that the Greeks had for their hell. And so that would be an issue, I think. Rather, we should have it in your own language instead of some other cultural language's idea. But those are the, the words that are translated. I bring this up because it will be brought up to you when you talk about hell about the Bible. We haven't even read the scriptures yet, but it will be told to you that your Bible is incorrect because hell is everywhere, and that's why you believe in hell, because they wrongly translated it to be hell in all these cases, right? In fact, I told you before, I told you that to teach universalism, you have to change your Bible, and this is one of the cases, because universalism wants to escape hell, and hell's in your Bible some 54 times, well, that's got to be changed. And they say that's a mistranslation, right? Well, it's not only a mistranslation of the King James folks. If that be true, it's a mistranslation in every popular English Bible, so it's one thing to debate one version or another. It's another thing to say every English translation of the Bible, save the ones the Universalists translated, all get it wrong. Right? But yeah, yeah, this is getting really fishy here. You're saying this doctrine in Christianity is invented because every version in our language got it wrong. That's very interesting and I think suspect. Look at Ezekiel 31. So I bet you didn't know that in the Bible the same word translated hell was translated grave. You know, it doesn't matter because in your English you can make the connection. And that's what I want to show you here, how in the English you can learn the same thing. It may take you longer, but you know what? It's less relevant, actually. You know this. But in Ezekiel 31, look how grave and hell are connected in this passage. Verse 115. Thus saith the Lord God in the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. He went down where? To the grave. I caused a mourning, God said. I covered the deep for him. Well, did you know that hell comes from the word hidden or deep? Well, you can know that if you read Ezekiel 31 and look at it carefully. It says, 
I covered the deep for him. I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed. And I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to where? Hell. What well, thought I cast him down to the grave? He did. Cast him out of the grave. Cast him down to hell. Hell and the grave. There they are. Did you know that hell can mean the grave and the grave can mean hell? Well, according to Ezekiel 31, apparently yes. Does it always mean that? That's what we're trying to find out. But you see, my, my point is you don't have to know every Hebrew tense to, to understand your English Bible if you want to study it. We also know that from verses like Psalm 10, verse, Psalm 16, verse 10, where David says, we'll repeat this verse a little bit later, that God will not leave his soul in hell. Does that sound familiar? Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. It's going to be a verse that Peter's going to say refers to Jesus. But in Psalm 49, in verse 15, what do we read? I'll read it to you here. God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. This is David, same David talking. How God's going to save his soul from the power of the grave. He's not keep my soul in hell. He's not going to keep my soul in the grave. Okay. Hell, hell and the grave. Apparently they're related. Yep. How are they related? They're exactly the same. Is there a difference? Well, hell is not just the grave. Look at Psalm 139. The grave, of course, is when you die where you put your body, right? When you die, you put bodies in a grave. They're dead. You put them in the earth or in a tomb or something like that. But in Psalm 139, and when they're dead, it's like they stop moving. They're dead. They're not there anymore. Everyone understands that? Like, where'd they go? Well, they're dead. Usually what falls in conjunction with universalism, usually, not all the time, is this belief that when you die, you cease to exist or cease to be conscious or you know, the idea of soul sleep. You've heard that before. And the point of my lesson today is not to combat that necessarily, but just to give you a thought here in Psalm 138, uh, 39, verse 8. David writes, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Apparently God's in hell. I thought God was in heaven. Well, he's both. He's in heaven and he's out. He's, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent, right? But he's in hell. Well, you say, well, hell means the grave. That's where your body goes when it dies. Well, if God's there, God's not dead. You understand? So he's everywhere. And so it doesn't mean just the grave. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Death cometh by sin, and the judgment on sin we covered last week is death. The wages of sin is death, and we all deserve death, and the consequences of sin, of death and hell. The Bible talks about death and hell together many times. Those who deny the idea of hell being punishment or torment or suffering would say, well, hell is simply just death. Hell is the grave. Hell is the same way of saying when you die, your body's done. It doesn't move anymore. In Philippians 1, look what Paul says about his death in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Oh, wait a minute. If when you die, you just lay in the dirt until a future time, like in the grave, that's where you're at. It's like, where are you when you die? The response of the universalist or the soul sleepers might say, well, you're, you're unconscious. You're in the grave, right? Paul says it's gain for him if he dies. Well, either he's really having a miserable day, or actually it's gain for him. And he goes on to verse 22 to say, If I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I'm a straight betwixt two choices, these two things. Having a desire to depart. That's his death, right? To depart and to be with Christ. Is Christ in the grave? Nope. We got a problem here. Okay. It can't be that hell is just the grave. Apparently there's a connection. Hell is something that happens after you die. But it's not simply putting your body in the ground. Does that be true? When Paul says, if I die, it's gain, it's not simply, I'm pretty sure you being unconscious will be worse than you being conscious. If that was Paul's choice of him saying, well, I can either die and be in the grave or be alive and help minister with you, he would go, I think I'm going to stay here, which he did. But I think there would not be any straight betwixt the two. It'd be pretty easy at that point, right? Instead, the straight is, if I die, I'm with the Lord, not in the grave, right? And so that shows you that hell's not just the grave. And people just aren't in the grave when they die. There's something else. What happens to their soul? What happens to them? Their body's obviously right there. We can see it decomposing. But where are they? Right? If you look at the Old Testament in your King James Bible, you'll find 31 places where hell shows up. 
you will not find the word hell in any of the other popular English Bibles, ESV, NIV, New American Standard. The New King James does have it. But the ESV, NIV, New, New American Standard does not have any soul going to hell in the Old Testament. You say, so what? Well, they have quite literally removed the word hell from the Old Testament. So yeah, but it's in the New Testament. That's true. Except a common defense of the idea that people simply die and go to the grave and not to hell is that hell is not the word in the Old Testament. Where do they get that idea? From the Hebrew and from New English Bibles. So it's like there's an issue. If it's wrong teaching, then it actually def it, it, it equips you, it guards you against it to have hell in the Old Testament. I'm trying to get you to trust your Bible as you hold it in your hand when it says hell over there in Ezekiel and Psalms. Because it's just fine a translation. Okay. Look at Matthew 10, 28. I mentioned to you earlier how there are different religions with different concepts of hell, and yet hell is what they use to describe those ideas in English. And that's because the word hell isn't confined to simply one person's variation of it. You understand? Obviously, culturally, you have the Hindus teaching hell, the Buddhists teaching hell, the Muslims, and they all mean a different thing. But hell is still a definition. It's a place where the dead and the damned go. It's where suffering. Does it, does it mean you have to define how long it is? Not necessarily. Hell can still exist, and you don't know how long it exists. Hell can still exist, you don't know if anybody's in there, or who's there, or how to get there, or where it is. You can be ignorant of all these things, and yet hell can still be. You understand? And so I'm trying to filter out today, because we'll talk later in our series about how long hell is, or who is in hell, which are important questions here for universalism. But today it's just, what about hell? Does it actually exist? And I think when you look at the Bible, there should be a definitive, yes, it does. I still have questions about it, but it does exist. But that's a big step forward from the universalists, and not all of them, but some of them say this, that hell simply is an invention of paganism introduced to Christianity. And that's not true. Okay. Where did I tell you to turn here? Matthew 10. Matthew 10, 28. Jesus says, don't fear him if he can kill the body. Right? But what's he say? Him that can kill, the, destroy the body and the soul. Matthew 10, 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Body and soul are different, yes? So you kill the body, is the soul dead if they can only kill the body? No. Kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul and body in hell. You see, there's the grave, which is what people do when they kill bodies. They can't kill your soul, but they can kill your body, and they can put it in a grave. People do this. But what's Jesus saying? There's one that can kill your soul and your body in hell. So apparently hell has something to do not just with the body, but with soul, right? The, the thing that is you that can be destroyed has to be destroyed in hell, because it can't be destroyed with a knife or a gun or anything anyone else can do to you. Only that can happen in hell. Hell is the place for the souls of the dead or the damned reserve for judgment. It's where things get destroyed. The souls get destroyed, Right? You say, well, isn't that related to the grave somehow? Somehow, but it may not be in a physical plane. You know what I'm talking about? It may not be in that dirt pile you just dug up. Because it has to do with your soul. And so Matthew 10, 28, we have a description there of soul and um, uh, be, being confined in hell. And in the Old and New Testament, we also find that these words... People say, well, the Old Testament has this Hebrew word, the New Testament has a Greek word, and these are different. We have to, we have to recognize that, so we need to take hell out of the Bible. Uh, well, uh, the words are the same, okay, in translation. So how do you know, Justin? Who made you the infallible translator? Um, it's not me. It's actually God doing the translating. In Psalm 16, verse 10, where David says, that will not leave my soul in hell. And in Acts 2, 27, where David quotes the same verse, or Peter quotes the same verse that David said. And instead of Sheol, he says Hades. Or in English, hell, both places. So you see, he quotes the same verse. It's right to put the same word there in your language. The New Testament is written in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew. You speak English. How do you translate both of those verses into English? What's the word? Hell. That's the word, right? So it's just fine. Uh, the words mean the same in different languages. That's another, put that on the list of, uh, it may have been already, on the list of um, translations that we taught earlier in the year you can know in your English Bible that help you translate. So if you're a Bible believer at all, especially in your King James Bible, you need to believe in hell. It's a word used in every popular translation. It's a word that describes a place for the souls of the dead and the damned reserved for judgment. 
And we'll see now, as we describe these verses, that it's, it's, a, it's a fine word for it. Okay. What does the Bible say about hell? Look at Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. This is the first mention in your Bible of the word hell. Hell is just a pagan invention, a cultural tradition. It's, a, it's a, something created by men who just hate other people and need something to control them with, and so they strike fear into their hearts by teaching hell. And don't you remember the Inquisition? They went around scaring people and giving money to the church. They used hell for that. You know, I mean, this is, this, hell is terrible. Well, the fact that people use the Bible wrongly doesn't mean that the Bible's wrong. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 22, you find the first use of the word hell, and it seems to include a lot of the descriptions that universalists would want to remove from it. Deuteronomy 32, verse 22, he says, verse uh, 21 says, I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation, for a fire is kindled in mine anger. This is God's anger. And shall burn unto the lowest hell. Fire burning hell. You see, I'm not trying to invent what hell is. I'm trying to find out what the scripture says it is. And God says, my anger is burning a fire to the lowest hell. He doesn't say, my anger is putting flames in the highest heaven. He never says that in the Bible. But he does say this. So apparently hell is where God's angry and there's fire. Not something I want to be dealing with. You know, that's already I'm afraid of it. <laughs> and that's what God intends to put here. He says, and shall consume the earth with her increase. The increase of hell, of fire. Shall consume the earth. It's a place of consumption. Right? And set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. That's the closest you get to Greek ferocious monsters is right there. It's like, what? The teeth of beasts? By the way, there's some pretty horrific and hellish concepts in the scripture. I might, I might tell you about that from Isaiah and other prophets that talk about in the end where God will use the animals of the earth to pour out his judgment on humanity. And that is terrifying, folks. Because we pride ourselves in having conquered the animal kingdom, you know, to a degree. And yet what if the animal kingdom and all the trillions of insects turn on you. That's not going to be good. But there's prophecies that talk about this. Because God's in control of them all. Anyway, that doesn't sound very good. So the first mention of hell includes a dimension. Notice it said the lowest hell. There's a dimension to it. So it's not an abstract thought. It's not like, do you feel bad about yourself today? Or is God making you feel guilty? These are all like you know, inside emotional experiences you have. But instead, it's a, it's a place, apparently. But that's precisely what those who would deny hell from the scripture want to say it's not. It is not an actual place where there's fire burning. Well, what's Deuteronomy 32 mean? There's a lowest hell. So, well, that's God's judgment on the earth to Israel. Yeah, it still wasn't good. There was still fire and destruction and consumption and burning a goo, if you read Leviticus 23. Not good stuff. So there's fire, there's devouring, there's terror. If you read the next verse that we didn't read, there's terror. Let's go on, look at Proverbs chapter 9. That's one verse, though. I mean, maybe we're getting the context a little bit wrong. Or something. We've got to have more than one verse to teach something. You should never teach a doctrine, especially dogmatically, with just one verse. Right? That's the truth. Everything in the Bible is the Word of God, and every verse is inspired by God, but if a doctrine is only taught in one place in the entire Scripture, guess what? It's not the most important. Right? So if that's where hell belongs, where it's only taught in one place, there's only one pastor who really talks about it, then you know what? Fine, then you know, let's put it over there in the non-important category and move on about our business. But when you find it in some 50 verses and then described in more, 50, dozens more in other languages, other language in the scripture, other words, then you start to think, well, this is a theme throughout. Yeah. This seems to be a consistent description. Proverbs 9, verse 18. Hell is a place with depths. Proverbs 9, 18 says, He that hideth hatred with lying, uh, that's the wrong verse entirely. Proverbs 9, verse 18. But he knoweth not, this is talking about a, a man that follows the, the, the foolish woman in verse 13. Stolen waters are sweet, bread eaten in secret is pleasant, but he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Depths of hell? You mean like emotional depths, like when someone says, oh, you're really a deep person, right? That's what that means? Or is it actual geography? Well, this is, this is the question, isn't it? Look at Proverbs 15. Maybe we need some more data here. Proverbs 15, 24. 
He says, the way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. But, okay, wait a minute. So the way of life is up and hell is down. This is like geographical location. Okay, there's another data we're adding to this. So this is kind of like when Paul says, set your affection on things above, right? He doesn't actually mean up. He just means on a higher mental plane. I think he means like heaven where Christ sits, right? That's what he meant in Colossians 3. So we have heaven, which is up, being contrasted to hell, which is beneath. So just as real as heaven is a place, apparently hell should also just be as real a place. Isn't that what we're seeing so far? And we've only covered a few verses. We look at Job chapter 11. Job 11 verse 8. It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? So again, we have a comparison between heaven and hell. So Christians talk about heaven and hell, and guess what? It's biblical language, right? Are you going to heaven or hell? Well, that implies it's a place that you go to. But the Bible is just talking about heaven as being up and hell as being down. Isaiah 14, verse 15, talks about Satan. Actually, it's talking about prophetically Satan, but... He's talking about his agenda, Satan's agenda to ascend to the Most High. Remember this chapter? In fact, there's four, five, four or five chapters in Isaiah where he mentions hell prophetically. It was very interesting. We studied this verse by verse before. Isaiah 14, 15. He says in his agenda, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Clouds are real things. They're high, and he wants to ascend above them. I will be like the Most High. God is above all things. And he says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. It's metaphorical, metaphorical language, we're told. Okay, so it's not actually a pit. Was it Jerry Falwell that went over to Russia somewhere and said he claimed to hear the screams of hell and they dug a, a pit down really far? <coughs> there that was? Just recently, some archaeologists made the headlines because they, they found the, the hidden tombs in Mexico where legend has it, there was actually a bottomless pit there. They haven't found the pit, but they found the doors in the records that said behind which are the pit. They just haven't got through the doors yet. No, they found it, they think. But they'll really disprove Christianity now. Isaiah 14, 15 says, He'll be brought down to hell, the sides of the pit. There's geography and depths. We've already seen in Psalm 139 that God is there, apparently. And we read in Proverbs that everything is open to him. Hell and destruction is open to God, meaning it's not closed off from him. You and I can't see heaven. We also can't see hell. Like this pit they're talking about, these depths. This is closed to us. And if people do go there, we can't access it. And yet Proverbs says they're all open to God. Hell and destruction are open. He sees it all. Okay. In Job 26, verse 6, we have Job saying here, Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. This is about God. He can see it. And of course, God sees everything. In Amos 9, 2, it actually says in Amos that people will try to dig down to hell. And what it's meaning there is that they're trying to get away from God. Hell, as I told you before, and people will tell you, hell means hidden, right? It means a, a, a place of the dead where it's closed off. You put the body in the coffin. People die and you don't see them anymore. The Bible tells us that. And in Amos, he says that even though they dig down to hell, God will send them there. He will take them there. It's interesting. So he can't, they can't escape God's judgment. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Sounds like Tower of Babel, doesn't it? Though they try to get up there, he's going to knock them down. Though they try to dig down to hell, he says, I'm going to take them there. God is the one, apparently, in Amos 9, that serves out reward or punishment and direction. But you see the locations. We're talking about location here, which is very interesting. Luke 12, 5, Jesus says a similar thing, where he talks about fearing him who casts into hell. Now, that raises some implications about God's judgment, which we'll talk about in some lessons. We have been dealing with that in Romans 2. But does God send people to hell? Really? Uh, Luke 12, 5 says, I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Je this is Jesus' words. Red letters, right? Jesus' words. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Who is this? There's only two possible options here. One is the cultural idea, maybe some biblical evidence, that Satan is the one that cast to hell. He had keys at one point. But what's happening here is this is God. Yeah. 
hell is open to God. And Jesus says, fear him. Now, that's interesting. We'll talk about this in a later lesson, but one of the, the key arguments for universalism is that, well, God is a God of love, not fear. Perfect love casts out fear, and you shouldn't fear God. He gives you grace and love and wants to save everyone forever. And then Jesus says, fear him who can cast into hell. That's like an instruction. Well, you shouldn't be afraid of anything, is what, what we we're told. But doesn't the Bible also say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? The beginning of wisdom, not the manifold revelation of all wisdom, but the beginning. That's what we're starting with hell. We'll end up with the manifold revelation of God where he gives grace to all. But we have to start with hell. We have to at least, if we're going to be universalists, we've got to be biblical universalists. Do you understand? We have to be Bible believers. Otherwise, none of it makes sense. And so we got to believe in sin and that we are all sinners, that we deserve judgment and death, and we got to believe in hell. The Bible is teaching hell, so we got to believe that too. So if hell exists and we're all going to be saved, God's going to save us out of that. We can't be universalist that denies it because the Bible teaches it. That's the point of what I'm trying to communicate this morning. Look at 2 Samuel 22. Second what? Yeah, I've been there in a while. 2 Samuel 22. Here's David, and you find in 2 Samuel, actually, a quotation of uh, what David writes in a song. You find it in Psalm 18 as well. This is one of those repetitions in the Bible we talked about some weeks ago. Psalm 22, verse 5. When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The so He's afraid of death. You see that? The sorrows of hell compassed me about. Well, I thought the waves of death compassed you. Well, now he says the sorrows of hell. See, there's death, and then hell comes. And, the, and it's a sorrowful thing. So there's sorrow with hell. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, so he's distressed, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. God was angry. God's a God of love. Yeah, he is. He's also a God of vengeance. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils. Really? Like, is that the image of God you want on your table when you're studying the scripture? Is smoke coming out of God's nostrils and flames coming out of his mouth? Like, that's like a dragon or something. But this is God in the context, folks. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. He wasn't a cherub, which is what Satan is. He rode upon one, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of skies. No, 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 the God I know is light everywhere. We haven't got to that part yet. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. You see, when Jesus comes back, it will be a day of darkness and gloominess, and he'll come back in flaming fire. The light of his return to the earth will be flames. Yeah. It'll be a dark day. Remember the sun turns dark into blood, moon turns to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord? That's what David's talking about prophetically in Psalm 18. This is God. This, this, we need to confine what we think about God and describe what we know about hell and his judgment to what the Bible says. Amen. Right? You want to see all men saved? I do too. So does God. Right? But we have to follow what Scripture says, or we don't know anything to be true. Verse 14, The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered His voice, and He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning, and discomfited them. Right? Well, that's taken right out of Greek paganism. You know, the Greeks actually came after David, historically, so no. Right? In fact, a lot of the pagan ideas that you think are paganism are distortions for what used to be originally Hebrew revelation. <laughs> yeah. We covered that back in our Genesis studies. But you see God here coming back in dark clouds. He makes the darkness his pavilions. He stands on him. He comes back with fire and lightning. People doubt the, the description of the Bible of hell. How can it be dark and fiery at the same time? Well, um, there's a lot of ways that occurs. Like think of storms, for example. Like thunderstorms. Like is it dark when it gets stormy? Yup, clouds and all that. Is it also bright? Well, the lightning flashes. It's like, yep, there you go. Or what about like a campfire at the very least, not a, you know, some sort of giant burn pile you have. You do it at night or something like that. It's very dark outside, and yet there's a fire right there. It's dark and fire at the same time. In fact, if you've seen coals when you burn a fire, the coals, ironically, are both light and dark. You ever seen that? 
They're not like gleaming like the sun. They're both light and there's like dark places in them. So it's dark and light. See, this is a thing that we can know by experience. So when the Bible describes this sort of thing, of course, we have this association, but it's not a contradiction at all. But hell apparently has to do with distress and fire and light and darkness. And these are all descriptive words of hell in the scripture. Unquenchable fire is in the Bible. Nowhere does the scripture talk about fire that should not be quenched. Well, actually, that's biblical language. Right? But yes, well, what kind of fire? Fire burns. But it's not people burning. Well, we haven't got there. We're just describing hell. Even if hell is empty, we must believe that hell exists yeah. from the Bible. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 28. The destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. Remember, sinners deserve hell. Is what we said last week. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. It says, For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which ye have desired, and ye shall be confounded for the gardens ye have chosen. For ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fades, and as a garden that hath no water. That's like a barren tree. And the strong shall be as a toe, and the maker of it as a spark. And they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. What's that mean? They get burned up. Right? This is God's judgment here. Well, what's hell? It's a place where the souls of the dead go reserved for judgment. And this is talking about judgment here and what it looks like. Isaiah 66, we're on one part of Isaiah, turn to the very last chapter of Isaiah, the last verse. Isaiah is about the judgment of the nations and of Israel and also the salvation of the world through Israel. That's what Isaiah is about. It takes about 90 weeks to study it. Speaking from experience, we've done that here. And Isaiah 66 is the good part. Like the good part where Christ returns. The Messiah comes back, saves Israel, and the world's getting blessed. All the nations are getting blessed. And, this, and Isaiah ends in verse 24 with not like, and happily ever after, right? It ends in verse 24 with, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring to all flesh. The end. What? What? Where do Christians get this idea that hell lasts forever, that it's like hell's in the end, and not that on the end all get say, well, the end of Isaiah, there's hell. That's not the end of the Bible. Granted. Let's keep reading. Hopefully there's something better, right? You read Revelation. There's not, not a very good ending to that either when it comes to transgressors. See, the good ending comes to those that love God and are called according to his purpose, to saved people. Would God, a loving God, let his children burn in hell forever? Um, we're not all his children. In Amen. fact, none of us were his children until we were saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Christ made us that by his grace. So there's a problem with the thinking there. Okay? In fact, if we're not his children, then we're the enemies of his children. So would you destroy an enemy that tries to hurt your child? Would a loving God do that? I have a lesson called God's love and hell. We'll talk about that in a few weeks, but there's, there's a big issue with trying to deny God's character as the scripture describes it by assuming that he's only and always love in the way you define love. What about hell? It's unquenchable fire. Matthew 5, 22, Jesus says the same thing many times. In fact, Jesus mentions hell quite a bit. Many of the New Testament mentions of the word hell is by Jesus himself. Many of you probably already knew that. But what does he say about hell? Because what we believe about it has to comport to the Bible. Let's see here. My pages are stuck together. Matthew 5, 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So what are you saying, traditional heller? That if he says fool to you, that he burns in hell forever? Like, that doesn't seem just and fair. Well, we'll deal with that in the future. And also, don't forget last week that we all deserve hell. And you say, well, that's one minor type of thing. If we're all sinners, sin deserves to be eternally condemned. Amen. Right? So, no one deserves anything better than eternal condemnation if they're a sinner. Well, he says, well, if they commit this sin, it's, it's danger of hellfire. Well, everybody's in danger of hellfire, is what the scripture says. But he's talking about seriousness of sin here. But look what Jesus says about hellfire. It's fire, right? We can tell that. I mean, the word is fire. 
or whatever it is, whether it's a momentary thing, a birthday cake candle, or whatever, it's fire. There's fire there. Hell includes fire. Matthew 18, verse 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off. That seems kind of drastic. And cast them from thee, for it is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, enter life maimed, because you cut off the, the offending part, rather than having two hands or two feet and cast into everlasting fire. You say, well, the word everlasting, I, I don't care about that word right now. I really don't. Forget the word everlasting. Take it out of your Bible. It's the only time you hear me say that. It belongs in your Bible, right? <laughs> but that's not the topic today. We'll have a topic about e duration and eternality. Look what it says next word, fire. It's fire. Whatever this is includes fire. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter to life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. It's the same thing. He's talking about the same thing. Everlasting fire, hell fire, same thing. Fire means fire. Hell means, well, not there yet. We're not going there yet. Hell includes fire. That's what we're learning from the passage right now. Mark 9.43. I'm trying to show it, 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 you can do the study of hell as we're doing here and, and get the ideas. You can say, I forget paganism, forget tradition, forget what I knew, everything I knew was wrong. Open your Bible the first time and you'll hear these doctrines taught. How do you deny them? Right? Mark 9, 43. These aren't difficult things to deduce from these. Mark 9, 43. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better, we've heard this before, than thee to enter life maimed and having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Did you get that? He'll say it again in verse 45. In verse 46, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Did you get that? He'll say it again in verse 47 and again in 48, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Like when God says things three times, especially in a row, well, actually two of those are translator errors. <laughs> That's what we're told. You still got one, don't you? The fire is not quenched. And that's repeated in the Old Testament multiple times. Right? Hell includes unquenchable fire. Do you know hell has gates? Matthew 1618. Don't you know the passage that people argue about over Roman Catholicism and Protestantism? On this I'll build my church, Peter. Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yeah, that's just an allegory. How many things are allegories that Jesus doesn't say are allegories? But how many times did he mention hell and the dimensions and the layers and the geography and the gates and the access and the keys before you go, you know what, I think it's a place that has access with keys and gates and it contains things. It has gates. It has keys. We'll read the, on the top of your outline there. I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Who's that? Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And he has the keys of hell and death. Oh, Jesus just used a flower language. He came and died to get those keys. Right? Hell is real, folks. It's real. That's all I'm trying to show today. Yeah, but it's not forever. I, I'm not even talking about that. It has to be at least five minutes. And I said that a couple weeks ago. If hell were just five minutes, it's terrible. Like, a minute now is not, is, is not good. It's bad because that's what we're reading here. Destruction, distress, fire, lightning, unquenchable fire. If anyone ex experienced half of this while you're yet alive, you think that's a tragedy. Yeah. Unless they deserved it. Well, how on earth can anyone deserve it? Well, that was last week's lesson. And something you should remind yourself over and over again. You do not deserve life. You don't deserve to get things from God because you want them. That's called theft. Only by His grace can you have them. It has gates. It has keys. Matthew 23, verse 15, it has inhabitants. We, we mentioned this last week where there are children of hell. Matthew 23, 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. When he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. The child of hell? Like, we're all God's children. Well, not that dude. The child of hell? Like, that's not God. Right? The child of hell. Wow. Well, that means he belongs there, doesn't he? You know what it means? Isaiah 5 has this interesting statement where it talks about hell hath enlarged herself. Yeah. Herself. Well, the Hebrew and the genders there, you know. It says herself. Like, why didn't it say himself or itself? Like her, her like a, a woman, like a mother. Right? Like this mother's enlarging herself to bring her children home. Like, that's the thought, right? Like, 
Come on home, we've got a big house here. There's a child of hell. Like people belong, there's inhabitants to hell. Yeah. Right? Just like heaven welcomes people home, hell apparently welcomes people home because there's children of the John 8, 44, he says, you're of your father the devil. And hell was made for the devil and his angels, by the way. <laughs> Revelation 20, 13. See, how do you know there's anything in hell? Because I have a book that prophesies the future in Revelation 20, verse 13, and it says, The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Guess what's in hell? Dead. The dead. Dead people. The souls of the dead, because I'm pretty sure their bodies were decomposed long ago in the dirt. But in hell, the dead was delivered up in Revelation 20 after the thousand year millennium, right? And they were judged every man according to their works. You mean hell doesn't only exist, but there's people there? It seems to say so. Right? It seems to say so. I don't like it either. Right? I don't like it either. But if God's word is inspired, and I believe it is, and God is true, then this is true. Right? And there must be, I know I sound like evangelical now, must, must be a good reason for it. We'll be studying this in our series, right? How can a loving God... And people to hell. We'll, we'll be studying this. Well, how is hell righteous? I want to talk about the righteousness of hell. It gets, that seems like a contradiction to people these days. You know, hell is righteous. Just like heaven is. God is righteous. That's why. And if he's the one that's directing how things occur, then it's righteous. Hell wasn't created by sinners. <laughs> its fires are inflamed by sinners and God's breath against them, but We'll deal with this in a little future lesson. Look, look at Jew, uh, 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter. I hope you're noticing here the passage we're quoting from. So far, not many from Paul, have we? Paul has a few. We'll get there, but not many. So if you're Pauline, or if you're spending your time studying God's grace dispensed to Paul, which you should be, how much time are you spending with descriptions of hell? How much? You see, and then that doctrine gets weak in your mind. I don't find it anywhere, and all I see is God's love and grace. Yeah, well, you, you should. That's, that's on you. That's your, God's love and grace towards you who believe the gospel, right? And yet, all the Bible, all Scripture is profitable. We get a deficient from that. 2 Peter 2, in verse 4, says, if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Wait a minute, angels are in hell? That verse says very clearly, there are angels in hell. But cast them down to hell. I thought angels were in heaven. Well, see, you're all confused, right? We're, we're defining the Bible here. The Bible says that hell is this place where souls of the dead or damned go, and there's angels that are damned. Like, they're not little cherub babies with wings. That's not angels. Like Angels or beings that God created that are stronger and smarter than you, and they sinned, and they don't die like you, and he casts them down to hell, bypassing the death part because they don't die. They're down in hell. Now they're damned. They're reserved for judgment forever. And delivered them into chains of darkness. See that? Somehow darkness, and people ponder what this could possibly mean. Like angels apparently somehow get their movement ability with light. And there's chains of darkness. It confines them. And hell's dark. And there's chains of darkness. And they can't get out. To be reserved unto judgment. You see, that's where I get the definition of hell. So th this is a pretty clear passage here. It has nothing to do with humanity. Understand? This verse has nothing to do with man. You can still be universalist. All men get saved. But those angels reserved in judgment forever. <laughs> right there in hell. Hell is a place where people are, or beings, here in this case angels, reserved unto judgment by chains of darkness. 2 Peter 2 verse 17 these are wells without water. Now, this is talking about men. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Uh-oh. So angels are in hell, and men can go there too? That seems to be what it's saying. Look at Jude, verse 6, just a few pages over. Peter's actually copying something that Jude wrote, or Jude copying Peter. Jude 6. The angels which kept not their first estate... You know about real estate? A state is a place. They kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. You have a habitation, you have a house, right? They left their first estate, they left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. 
What's 2 Peter 2 say that place is? Hell. So they left one habitation to inhabit another habitation, which is hell. Hell is a place inhabited by beings, by creatures, angels, and potentially men. Revelation 20 says men, right? People are also in there, the dead and the damned. So there may be a lot of exaggerations in the cultural depiction and caricature of hell, but there's also some seed of truth when we look at the Bible. Yeah. Hell is the place of the damned. Hell is the place of the dead. Hell is a place where you're reserved for judgment. God does apparently cast into hellfire. But we, got, we still got questions, don't we? We're going to deal with that. Look at Hebrews 10, or you're in Jude, Jude 6, we read verse 7, look at verse 13. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So we'll deal with some of that later. Hebrews 10, verse 27, the author of Hebrews writes, if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. This is not Pauline gospel of the grace truth right here. This is new covenant for Israel. We know that being dispensationalist, right? Look at verse 27. But a certain, certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. A fearful looking for, afraid, fearful of judgment and fiery indignation? That seems like they're being threatened with hell. You shouldn't threaten people with hell. Well, I, I would agree that that's not the first thing you tell people. They need to know about sin. They need to know about God and sin. And their sin deserves judgment. Amen. Right? Hell's a part of that. And God wants to save you from that. And he sent Christ and shed, give his grace so that you can be saved from it. And he wants all men to be saved. What is hell like? The Bible describes the soul in hell as conscience, folks. In Psalm 16, when, when David writes, That will not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer the Holy One to see corruption. In the next verse, he says, Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Which means the path of life, life, joy, pleasure, Okay, so what if you don't have life? What do you have? Death? What if you don't have joy? What do you have? Distress? Sorrow? What if you don't have pleasure? A dirty word? Pain? Yup. He says, you will not leave my soul in hell. You'll show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. What if you're not in the presence of God here? You won't have fullness of joy. You won't have pleasures forevermore. Hmm. Doesn't sound good. See, this is not good news. Aren't we sent to preach the good news? Yes. And I'm trying to deal with a doctrinal hole that's in people's thinking because they've only confined themselves to certain parts of the Scripture and not read all of it. All Scripture is profitable for doctrine, proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Psalm 86, verse 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Psalm 116, verse 3. It says, The sorrows of death com compassed me, and the pains of hell gat hold upon me. Psalm 116, verse 3 says, Hell is painful. But what does that mean? I mean, you're dead if you're in hell, right? Yup. Then how do you feel pain if you're dead? Good question. But he says, The pains of hell, right? Because there's the body that's in the grave. The body death does not feel nothing. There's not nerve endings moving around in the grave there. But there's your soul. Where's that at? Well, can your soul feel without nerve endings? It says there's pain. There's conscience. Con it's con there's no pain if you're unconscious. You understand? You're sitting there. Like you're unconscious. You, you try to hurt something. I'm going to hurt the pew. <laughs> well, I'm not hurting it. It's not conscious. It's not alive. You're, speak you're personifying it. But a soul is a person. Right. There's pain there. Verse 4, Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Deliver my soul from hell. And he says in verse 5, Gracious is the Lord. He, and he hears his cry. Isaiah 5 says that there's no knowledge of God, and the, the honorable are famished. They're starved, and they're thirsty. Starves, thirsty. And it says hell is enlarged by this. So it describes the condition of Israel and says that they're, they're famished, they're thirsty, and there's no knowledge of God. 
Therefore, hell is enlarged. Like, that's what hell is. Thirsty, famished, no knowledge of God. That's what hell is like. Well, that's not good. The Bible describes how hell, we'll deal with this more in a future lesson. Actually, hell and the bed that men make there, they make it. Like, their sins spark the fire. Their transgressions treasure up wrath against that day. The anguish they feel is because of the sins that are in them, not because God's a cruel monster. God's a righteous judge. Matthew 22, 13 says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You've heard those verses before? What are you supposed to do with those? These are dead people in hell. Weeping and gnashing. Well, you don't do that if you're unconscious, right? What is hell like? It's bad. It's conscious. Well, surely that shouldn't last very long. I mean, surely that will last a little while to purge your sins or something. We'll deal with that in a future lesson here. We're simply talking about the reality of it is. It makes you comfortable for today and before our future lessons say, well, this should only last a short time, maybe 12 months. Jews say hell lasts 12 months. After 12 months, if you haven't repented in hell, the Jews say, then you're destroyed forever. Like annihilated, you know. But 12 months of suffering to see if you'll change your mind. Just a year. <laughs> well, how long in suffering is too long, really? Some of you have had a bad year, you know. And it's like, wow, that's a terrible thing. Matthew 13, 42 Jesus talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth. He shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Say, so yes, Justin, that's a parable of the tares. He's talking about harvesting. Obviously, you put the harvest into the fire and the flames. Yeah, but they don't have teeth. <laughs> tares don't have teeth. And he, by the way, he says it again in verse 50 in another parable without tares. This one's about pearls. This one's about the net in the sea. You shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says, have you understood these things? And they said, please explain the metaphor. They said, yes, Lord. With faces of fear stricken on them, you know. That's not good. The kingdom of heaven is like this. If you're not in the net, you get thrown in the fire. If you're not one of the wheat, instead of the tares, you get burned up and you weep and gnash in your teeth. That's not a good thing. What about Torment. People talk about torment. You think God torments people forever? What do you, what, what do you, how do you define torment? Because torment is defined as pain and misery and anguish. And the Bible says that, Romans 2. You treasure up wrath and tribulation and anguish. Look at Luke 16. We can't cover the whole chapter, but I've got to show you just the, the data here. Four times in Luke 16, this rich man is in torment. Objection, it's a parable. Well, he doesn't say it's a parable, and it's the only time he uses someone's name. And he's, if you use a parable, you think you describe real things anyway, wouldn't you? Like you're not describing some unreal thing. Oh, he's using Greek paganism to describe a parable. He never does that. Luke, in Luke 16, four times, this rich man is in hell in torment. Have you read it? You say, I try not to. Luke 16, verse 23. In hell, this is the rich man who died, and he was in hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torments. He sees Abraham afar off. Well, you think this is real? He sees Abraham there. You think that he's actually, well, the point is Jesus is telling this event using things that can be acknowledged to be real. It's the thought there. Verse 24. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his tongue in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Verse 25, by the way, this is the very end of my outline, you notice? Because this is not the sole proof for hell. We've covered quite a few other verses, right? This just simply aligns with it. Luke 16, 25, Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. So Jesus uses the word torment. The rich man uses the word torment. Abraham uses the word torment. And the rich man will say it again in verse 28. For I have five brethren that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. This place of torment. So, yeah. You say, well, I don't know. I think it's a parable still. Look at Luke chapter 8. There's no evidence in the Bible for a uh, suffering, painful torment hell. Well, well actually, um, don't believe everything you hear in, in a tract at the fair. Open the Bible and read for yourself. That's what we'll tell people next week. Luke 8, 28. 
when this man who in verse 27 says, a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down with these devils right he, before him. And with a loud voice said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. That devil, he's putting lies into the Christian head thinking Jesus is going to torment him. Doesn't he know Jesus is going to pick him up and give him a big old hug and... The devil knows there's a time of torment and a place of torment. And this devil says, don't torment me. And then Jesus, in verse 29, says he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man for oftentimes it had caught him and told him what had happened. Jesus asked his name in verse 30. Our name, my name is Legion. It says he said Legion because many devils, many devils. And then verse 31, they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. Interesting study there. We don't have time for today. The deep what? The deep pit of torment whom angels are cast in, reserved in chains of darkness forever. And Jesus, uh, and Jesus actually hears his request. He does not cast him into the chains of darkness. Instead, puts him into those flock of pigs over there. So, uh, herd of pigs, right? Not flock. Herd of pigs. Yeah, thank you. Herd, not flock. And they jump off the cliff, right? But at least those devils aren't in torment. But you see my point here? Jesus was the one that would torment those devils by casting them in hell. Justly, righteously. Amen. So you don't need Luke 16, even though it says it four times that there's a man in hell in torment. Right? Revelation 9 talks about a bottomless pit. And a devil's thrown in there. Wow. And he's tormented in anguish forever and ever in Revelation 14. Revelation 20. Hell is a place of darkness and loneliness and boredom, fury, regret, fear, anger, pain. Bad place. It's a place that angels who sin deserve to go, who men who sin deserve to go. It's the place of the dead who go and are damned, reserved for judgment forever. There'll be a time where death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire will be the final everlasting destruction of those things and punishment. What's the conclusion of today's lesson? Hell exists. No matter what you think of how long it is, or how many people are there, or if you can get out of it, we, you have to know from the Bible that hell exists. We've seen the verses now. If you start the conversation of universalism with God's love and then go back to hell, this is, as the universalist says, inconceivable. And it is. If nothing separates you from the love of God and you try to talk about hell, you're going, this is not to do with me. You're right. But we're not talking about just you. We're talking about everyone that ever existed. And you're going to start in the beginning of the Bible. And hell is a real thing in the scripture. God is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. He will have all men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. And the Lord Jesus Christ came and conquered death and hell to receive its keys. Revelation 1.18 says that, right? Paul says in Romans 8, I've got to end on a word of hope here, because this is, this is discouraging. All our fears are coming true. There is a hell. There are people in it. But there's still hope for the universalists, because maybe they can get out. In fact, that's what a lot of biblical universalists say, that they're in it, but they can get out. Wow, because you can't deny the scripture that it's true. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us? Now, who's the us in Romans? You who trusted the gospel of the grace of God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or hell, might I add? No, nothing separates us. It's written, for thy sake, we are all killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, heavens, or hell, right? Nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Praise God. And so I leave hope for the universalist to come along with our series, right? It's like, maybe there's still hope, but hell is real. It's the place of the dead and the damned. It's the place of suffering, pain, and torment. How long does it last? We've yet to study. Okay. Any questions, any comments?